hi, my name is Jonathan Herps, uh, founder and CEO of Scale Up Growth Partners. Welcome to our stories of Scaling Up series, where we're, we are chatting with owners, managing directors, founders, and business leaders of scaling companies. It centers around their entrepreneurial journey so far and their aspirations to, for their companies. Today, we're speaking to Brad Ron. Rom, sorry, um, I apologize, our own Brad Rom, CEO um, at The Dinner Ladies. Um, welcome. Thanks. Hi, hi, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my, my pleasure. So, listen, why don't you, um, fascinating name for a company, why don't you give us a, a quick rundown on, on what you do? So the Dinner Ladies, um, <clears throat> founded by, by two ladies, uh, Catherine Westwood and Sophie Gilliard, uh, way back in about 2007. Uh, story goes... Um, they, they met at the school gates. They um, identified a gap in the market at that time to um, basically prepare meals for time for friends um, with a similar background with young kids and uh, and started this business from really humble beginnings um, out of out of a shed um, um, to cook meals for friends and family and just started like that um, and just has grown ever since. So not, not a new business by any means. Um, it's been growing organically since then. Um, Quite, quite quickly, year in year, um, <clears throat> the business evolved from that shed into kind of um, rented out uh, kitchens uh, at a bowling club, at a butcher shop, um, raised enough funding to kind of move where we are now with one, ha- one warehouse, we've got a second warehouse and so forth. Um, and yeah, it's just now developed into a business of, of reasonable size and, um, and, and we elaborate shortly, but um, the, the, the COVID pandemic um, in, in the last couple of years has, has really catapulted this business forward and, and brought forward future growth plans. And um, that's kind of what accelerated me to getting involved. And uh, I guess the, the fact that it's been uh, founded by two, two women is why it's still called the Little Ladies. Okay. So when did, when did you join? So I joined just over two years ago, just after the COVID first started. Perfect timing. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, Probably it's, it's probably easy to describe, but who's your core customer? Who's your best customer? So look, I think we're in a quite a fortunate <laughs> position. We've got quite a very spread out customer base. <clears throat> it's it's we direct to consumer model, so it's just um, people. <laughs> um, uh, we, we operate mainly in New South Wales is our major market. That's where we're located. We've also got a presence in Victoria, Queensland, South Australia, um, ACT, um, and I'd say our typical customer are really time poor people. Um, mm-hmm. Typically, those people with uh, busy young professionals, with a young family, I, I would say that that's our kind of key, our, our kind of our generic customer. So, you, I mean, it's, you've got quite a lot of competition out there. Um, how do you differentiate yourself um, from, from the rest? Yeah. So, look, um, I mean, the the industry is fairly broad. I mean, call it we prepared meals, but you can break that down into many different uh, subcategories. You've got fresh prepared meals, you've got meal kits, you've got uh, dietary kind of prepared meals. Our niche is a frozen only offering. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I would actually say we haven't got that, we haven't got too many like-for-like competitors doing exactly what we do. You know, there are many competitors out there uh, that provide kind of fresh meal kits with perishable items. Um, there's many other um, players in the industry that kind of service B2B, supermarkets, all that. We, we don't do that. We do direct, we do direct to consumer frozen only meal. Uh, so we've got all the skills and expertise to provide that in terms of, 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 of expertise to provide that frozen meal. It's non-perishable. Um, we've got quite a long shelf life because of that. And it allows us uh, to actually scale up, scale the business across Australia from a, from a central location. So I'd say we're actually in a pretty, in a pretty unique niche in terms of, of, in terms of what we do. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of our competitive advantage. I'm going to say I'm looking at your website here and the food looks phenomenal. Well, that's... Um, yeah, that's what we do. We, we pride ourselves on quality. We pride ourselves on innovation. Uh, we offer a premium a premium product. Um, it's all about kind of yummy tasting, great food. Um, that's so that's kind of again our competitive advantage by offering high quality premium a premium a premium offering. Yeah. So look, we've all been through through the pandemic, and you mentioned you, you joined about that time. What actions have you taken in the business um, during the pandemic that, that you've kept uh, with the business going forward? Yeah, look, I think a lot of that stuff, um, a lot of that mentality is what I've helped to try and instill. And I think it's all about creating scalable solutions. I think that's, that's my personal skill set. I think um, the pandemic just accelerated the, 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 the scale. Um, as I said, it brought forward our growth plans. Um, 
it, it basically forced the business to get in, get into everything at water very quickly. Um, and that's I guess that's going to that's my what I helped to kind of shape. So it wasn't just me. Uh, we brought up some key people around me uh, at a similar time. For me, it was about getting the right structures, processes, systems in place to across all areas of the business, basically make it scalable. So it wasn't necessarily that structure when I joined. We had quit some average non-scalable systems. Um, and I would say a lot of the foundations to grow weren't yet in place when I joined. So where we are today, a lot of that now is in place. And we've had to basically be super, very agile and, and move very quickly to get this all all in order so we can kind of realise the growth that we've experienced. Thank you. So going forward, what are the, what are the challenges, um, main challenges you see and what does the future look like? Look, trying to maintain the growth. I mean, obviously, I don't have a similar, I think the pandemic was a, was an unnatural period for, for growth. Uh, I don't expect that, that growth rate to continue as a lot of the panic buyings now ease. A lot of the, a lot of people are resuming normality. Um, there's also a lot of um, uh, uncertainty in the economy, particularly in the food industry, in terms of rising costs of, of, of basically all inputs and sort of food costs. Um, there's well publicised uh, labour shortages around every, basically every industry, uh, navigating around that. Um, obviously, the, the, the war the impacts around that in terms of the supply chain challenges. And mm. so it's a very volatile time in the, in, in the economy right now. So it's just, look, it's, it's, it's trading with an element of caution, but whilst not trying to maintain growth at the same time um, is what guess my job is to try and, try and figure out and to try and work out how to keep uh, the yeah. business good growth trajectory. Okay, great. Um, so since you've been a CEO, um, what is your greatest learning been, do you think? Greatest learning is greatest learning, I think, is to always keep learning, I'd say, to always be <laughs> to, to always be look, it's things are moving in my experience, things are moving super fast. Uh, the world's changing very quickly. Um mm. pandemic's been no one knows. You can't plan anything. Things are changing almost on a daily basis. Um you have to be as yeah, just be as adaptable as you can. Um no, like no one knows the answers to everything. It's a matter of just working collectively as a group, and um, <clears throat> an element of de-risking things, de-risking decisions. Uh, I guess that's because because of the, the future. The future is just so uncertain. So um, look, it's been a challenging time. So it's very difficult to predict what the next day is going to look like. Yeah, it's an, it, it's it's interesting with my clients. I've been um, talking a lot about um, you know companies do annual planning and spend you know weeks and months doing annual planning and. We're moving more to a three, uh, the concept of a three-year plan and three-year goals, um, and but anchored in quarterly planning. You have yeah. to keep that that agility, but keep the quarterly plans, you know, heading towards the three-year goal. But um, yeah, which is exactly, exactly the point you're making, I think. Even quarterly is a, lot, a long time these days. It is. It is. Um, so tell me, when you think of the word successful, um, who's the first person who, who comes to mind and why? Yeah. I saw this. I look at. Look, uh, my opinion, it's hard for me to name a person. I, I define that as somebody who almost flies under the radar, um, yeah. who's, I, I, would, I would say, I mean, it depends how you su define success. In my view, it's somebody who basically has a, a work-life balance, who's able to afford the time to spend with family and friends, whilst also having not so much financial pressure. But I, 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 for me, it's someone who flies under the radar rather than a particular person out there in the public eye. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very difficult for me to say, kind of say who that is. It's interesting you say that. Um, this has turned out to be one of my favourite questions of, of, of the series <clears throat> and lots of different views. Um, uh, someone I interviewed this morning had a very similar similar, similar view to you. Um, and I explained to him that, you know, I've got two purposes. I've got a business purpose and a personal purpose. And my business purpose is to grow remarkable, grow remarkable leaders, grow remarkable companies. Um, my personal purpose um, is to play actively with my grandchildren, mm. which sounds a bit strange until you find out that I'm a 62-year-old father of two adopted children who are eight. Mm. And so this play actively with my, with my grandchildren is all about being happy and having a healthy and um, active life, which might not be my two eight-year-olds when we do that, um, yeah. but you know, and, and the long, long, longevity of it. So yeah, it's... For me, that's it, and having a positive mindset with all that as well, and being able to realize yeah. how lucky you are, and all that kind of. I think that to me, that's success. Um, yeah. Rather than trying to emulate someone who's out in the public eye that looks to be seen as successful to everybody else. It's a, and it's a, it's a really good point, and I, I 
if I can, I'll pick up on that work-life balance question, um, comment because I actually don't think for a CEO or, or an, an entrepreneur, I think work-life balance is really hard. I think because what happens is we spend so much time focused on work or our businesses and then our family, we forget, actually forget about ourselves and giving balance to you, you know, to you, you know, whether that be sport or whatever. It's a, it's a really big lesson. Anyway, um, are you a, are you a reader? Top three uh, business book podcasts. Admittedly, not a big reader. I do listen to a few business podcasts. Um, I think, Which ones uh, you like? Yeah, the one that I quite the, the two that I that I quite quite like is the Mark Burris Mentor. Mm-hmm. I find that quite a quite quite a good one. I find he's yep. always um I just I like what he has to say about him. I think he just talks he's down to earth. He talks he talks layman's language. Um mm-hmm. it's very relatable. Um and and I think some of the people that he interviews are quite uh like just just it's interesting stories to see kind of how to share their kind of success stories or share their challenges and stuff. And I find that quite relatable. Mm-hmm. Um the other the other person I quite like is uh Gary V. Um, and then, right. then, yeah. Look, he's um, it's quite intense, but um, he's uh, no, no, he's also like he just yeah, he's just good, good for motivational, motivational speaking, and he uh, he appeals to the younger audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, look, I think he's always worth worth, worth listening to. Yeah. And then, and then something like uh, Simon Sinek, I think his his um, yeah, his talks are quite good, and his books are quite good. Well, of course, Simon Sinek is that is that per- the, the why the purpose I was talking yeah. about. Any last piece, um, piece of advice or parting words for um, CEOs or up-and-coming up, up CEOs? No, look, for me, it's just about giving things a go. And, and I, I, I just find um, my biggest fear is regretting things. Um, so yeah. if, 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 like, if, if, I, like, if you get presented, if being able to identify an opportunity, I guess there's an element of skill there. But if you, if you realise you've got an opportunity, just doing whatever you can to try and take it because um, you don't know things until you give it a go. Um, yep. and I, and I just, I just feel regret having not 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 tried something, not not done mm-hmm. something. So that's kind of my only passing comment. Thank you so much, Fred. No problem. Thank you. As always with these, I'm I'm learning every time I do one. Yeah, no, that's great. Great. Thank you.